All right, everyone. Um, welcome uh, to our, our latest meetup for Bay Area NLP. Uh, I think this is one of the, the best turnouts uh, that we've had recently. Um, so thank you very much for, for coming. Uh, those of you who are standing, please get here sooner uh, for, for the next one. Um, and, um, uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll have seats for you. Uh, this is a, a really fun talk today. Uh, so the Stanford NLP Library has been going for maybe uh, 15 years as core NLP or Java NLP and under, under various names. Uh, it's something I worked on a little uh, when I was doing my PhD there. Uh, I hope for the sake of anybody using it that my code's not still in the code base. Um, uh, you all answered a question when you signed up, uh, which was, uh, have you used uh, either Core NLP or, or Stanford NLP before? And about a third of you had, which I, I was really impressed that this many people have already used uh, the library. Uh, a lot of people said that they'd only used Core NLP before, the Java library, which means you haven't got to take advantage of a lot of the new functionality um, or just the ease of integration uh, with, with Python. So I think you're gonna get a lot out of today. Uh, so uh, first off, I'd like to thank our, our hosts, uh, uh, Astound, uh, today, and uh, also uh, Caterer uh, First Republic. And Scott from them is going to say a few words. Yeah, I'll keep it quick. Thank you, uh, Astound and uh, the Meetup, for having us here. Uh, just to keep it simple, we're a private banking as well as private business. And we also do private uh, wealth management. So if you guys have any questions, I'll be in the back. We do anything from loans a lot of host of products and uh, we're just happy to be here and excited to hear this uh, presentation. So thank you everyone. All right, thanks Scott. <laughs> so if you, if you need a loan, go to the back. Okay. <laughs> uh, 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 Raggy, Dr. Raggy, um, uh, uh, qualified computer scientist as well as CEO of this town. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so this is actually a redundant job. I don't need to introduce Professor Manning. But Nikki insisted. Yeah, Nikki insisted I actually introduce Professor Manning. So I went to his Stanford web page um, just to get some more information about his background. And I mean, I, I've known quite a bit of his pro uh, contributions before. And actually, we could spend the entire meetup just talking about that. But uh, I'll say a few words. Uh, I've been waiting for this event for long, just like all of you. So I won't take too much time. Um, professor Christopher Manning is the Thomas M. Siebel Professor in Machine Learning in departments of computer science and linguistics at Stanford, and director of uh, Stanford AI Lab. Uh, Professor Manning is a leader in deep learning in NLP and also computational linguistic approaches to parsing, textual inference, multilingual processing, and, and many other things. Uh, 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 he co-authored leading textbooks on statistical approaches to NLP and information retrieval. Uh, he's an ACM fellow, AAAI fellow, ACL fellow, and a past president of uh, ACL. Uh, he's the founder of Stanford uh, NLP Group and manages the uh, Stanford Core NLP software. And some of the members of his team also will be talking to us today. So it's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Hi, everyone. Thanks a lot for coming. It's amazing and great to see so many people here. Um, so what did we're going to do today is we're going to talk about our Stanford NLP software um, with an emphasis on the Stanford NLP Python package that we've been developing more recently. And so first of all, there's me, Chris Manning, talking. I mean, I'm also really only here to warm up the crowd for a few minutes. Um, and then the main parts of the presentation will be being done by my um, colleagues, Jason Bolton, Peng Chi, and Yuha Zhang. OK. Um, and so this is sort of, I'm the who is the Stanford NLP group part. Um, but I do have a couple of um, oops. I do have a couple of points that I want to make just to give you some orientation to things. Okay, so um, the Stanford NLP group is our research groups with it has multiple faculty. There's me, Dan Jurafsky, Percy Liang, and Chris Potts. So we have a very lively and interdisciplinary between mainly linguistics and computer science, but also with several other people that are in psychology, um, education, interested in doing things with natural language processing. Um, I thought it might 
be just nice to say a little bit about the history of some of our um, Stanford NLP software. I mean, and my meta message here is, you know, in some sense, Stanford NLP has been a little bit weird in the following sense, that in the broader world, we are most known for a product that is pieces of software. But that's sort of really unusual and kind of wrong for an academic research group, because really as an academic research group, our two primary products um, should be ideas and people. Um, I'm not going to actually get through the ideas in my intro here, but I thought I'd at least sort of um, um, bring around a few of the people to sort of say some of the sort of students that have gone through and have been part of um, the Stanford NLP software. Uh, so I arrived at Stanford in fall of 1999. So this is actually my 20th anniversary. You can congratulate me on that. <laughs> um, and really, the first thing that we produced as a piece of open source software, um, the Stanford Parser, came out in 2002. Um, and then that led to other pieces of software. We had our Stanford MaxM classifier, Stanford part of speech tagger, Stanford um, conditional random fields that were used for named entity recognition and later for um, word segmentation. And so key students involved at that time include Dan Klein, Roger Levy, Christina Tutanova, and Jenny Finkel. Um, jumping along, um, in 2010, um, we, did, we did our first put things all together into one big integrated package, which we called Stanford Core NLP. Actually, that's the second thing we called it. It was very first called um, Baseline NLP Processor, but we decided that wasn't a very good brand name, so we slightly improved it and came up with Stanford Core NLP. And then lots of other components started being added into that, like SU Time, Sentiment, our neural network dependency parser, open information extraction. And the key people in putting together this unified core NLP um, were Jenny Finkel again, um, Mihai Serdianu, David McCloskey, and um, Stephen Bethard. But you know, overall, just a ton of the PhD students and some of the master students have been around the Stanford NLP group, have really have uh, contributed major components to this software. So for the Chinese and Arabic word segmenters, that has people like Bidran Chang and Spence Green, SU Time and Tokens Regex with Angel Chang, um, the Stanford Dependencies, marie Katrine de Manef, um, Dan Chi Chen for the Neural Network Dependency Parser, Bor Angeli for Open IE, um, Kevin Clark for Co-Reference, Roger Levy for Tregex and T-Surgeon, um, Chloe Kidden for Semgrex, a um, ton of people have been involved. Um, as well as Core NLP, we've had some other um, software products. Um, perhaps um, in the modern world, almost our best known piece of software actually is the glove word vectors, which I'm sure quite a few of you have seen and used, um, which were primarily Jeffrey Pennington's um, baby together with um, Richard Socha of coming up with a new global optimization method for learning word vectors. Um, for the, the, um, so switching gears slightly, um, for the material that we go, is going to be talked about later, um, the central element of it has been doing things around dependency parsing. Um, there's other stuff as well, but dependency parsing is very key. And that's sort of been a very key direction that our group has worked on over the last decade. And so I thought I'd just sort of say a few words of motivation about that. So the idea of dependency parsing is to say one can look at the structure of sentences by putting relations between words, of saying this is the subject of something, this is the object of something, this is an adjectival modifier, this is an auxiliary verb. And although we talk about phrases like the old man, we organize things so that the, the man is the subject dependent of a verb and then the older modifiers of man. And so dependency parsers have proven to be a very usable, shallow semantic representation for all sorts of purposes. And in particular, in recent years, 
I and others have been involved in this big project called Universal Dependencies. And the idea of universal dependencies was that although there'd been a lot of work on dependency grammars and tree banks for different languages and dependency parsers, they were, they were all completely incompatible with each other, both in trivial ways as the way the relations were named, but also in more profound ways as to what kind of structure of dependencies um, was given. And so the idea of universal dependencies was to have a common representation in some sense it's a simple common universal grammar that can be used for all languages and to try and get a lot of resources um, produced in the format of universal dependencies. And we combine that together by essentially building on ideas from Google for universal part of speech tags, um, from um, UFAL, the University of Prague, and the Czech Republic for morphological features and then the ideas we developed before as Stanford dependencies. But all of those things were the starting point, but they all changed and were put together to give us universal dependencies. And so in the last um, sort of four years, I guess, um, there's been a lot of effort from a lot of people um, to produce universal dependencies tree banks for many languages. It's well over 50 languages now. And you know, if you happen to be a speaker of Gujarati or Swahili or some language that isn't um, in universal dependencies, the best way that you can help in having NLP tools available um, for your language is contributing to the Universal Dependencies Project. We're very happy um, to have more contributions from different people. Um, that's some of the um, core group of Universal Dependencies, which isn't just Stanford people. It's a very broad collaboration, um, which has a lot of other people involved in it. Okay, um, yeah. Um, I just wanted to stress, being able to work out parses of the sentences is very important. Here is my example of that. Working out the correct modification dependencies of the word in this sentence is very important um, for getting the correct reading that you're meant to get. Okay, um, so in that context, um, we've been very involved um, with working out um, models for dependency parsing. And so um, back in 2014, um, Dan Chichen, um, working with me, sort of pioneered the first um, successful neural network method for dependency parsing and managed to have what was then a great parser that was as accurate as and much faster than previous machine learning dependency parsers. Um, building on that, there was then a lot of subsequent work and in particular, um, people at Google essentially expanded and developed in various ways Danchi's model to produce what became the syntax net and or parsey McParse face model, which is still the model you can find um, in Google Cloud. Um, but more recently again, we've sort of turned um, to a different method of doing neural dependency parsing, so-called graph-based dependency parsing, um, which later on Pone Newhow will expand more, which has sort of brought new advances in dependency parsing that are in our Stanford NLP project. Okay, so that's most of what I wanted to say, um, apart from here's my advertisement. Um, in the Stanford NLP group, we're always very happy to have money too. So if you don't want real estate um, or a loan, you can come to me instead and give me your money. Um, we're very happy to have gifts to support our students. Um, so the Stanford NLP group is part of the Stanford AI lab, which has an affiliates program. We're very pleased to have corporate affiliates in the affiliates program. And for the Stanford Core NLP, um, package is dual license with both GPL and the commercial license and actually up in the back corner there's Chris Tagg um, who um, deals with some of the licensing of Core NLP so you're very welcome to speak to him as well. Okay, thank you. Right. I now introduce Jason Bolton. What's the city that you're from again? Bundaberg. So I, what I found out today is that he's from the city uh, where that ginger beer. Does anyone in here get that ginger beer, the famous one in the kind of, raise your hand. And he, that, so he's competing with that ginger beer for the most notable. Uh, <clears throat>
All right. Oh, oops. <laughs> Sorry. I don't have my Wi-Fi on. Sorry. That person. All right, so I'm here today to talk about Stanford NLP and the Stanford uh, Core NLP server. Uh, just to preserve our sanity, we have several uh, entities that we're interested in talking about today that all have kind of a similar name. So I thought I would like clarify what these things are so that we know the differences. Um, Stanford Core NLP, Stanford Core NLP is the group's long-term software package that uh, I just found out it's 2002, not 2000, it's not 2003, it's 2002, but I was pretty close, so uh, that's Stanford Core NLP. Uh, Stanford NLP with no space is the new Python library that we uh, just released last year. So if there's no space in it, we're talking about the Python library. Stanford NLP with a space, if you add a little space in there, <laughs> is the group in general. <laughs> or you could say any NLP that's done at Stanford, I guess. So Stanford's the adjective of our natural language processing. So, so in summary, core NLP is the Java software, 2002. Stanford NLP, no space, is Python. Stanford NLP with a space is the group. And I have a helpful sentence to, uh, to uh, make that very clear to everyone. So Jane, a member of Stanford NLP, debated whether she should use Stanford Core NLP or Stanford NLP for her Stanford NLP project, which analyzes core Stanford NLP papers throughout our history. I hope that, I hope that clarified things. So. <laughs> um, so Stanford Core NLP is our long-term uh, Java software. <laughs> Once again, my, my date error shows up, but uh, okay. Um, and it has a kind of a large collection of NLP tools that are, you know, kind of a blend of statistical methods and rule-based methods. We support six languages, English, Arabic, Chinese, French, German, and Spanish. Um, it has a pipeline API, which will kind of start with raw text and run all the way through and get you a, a finalized annotation object. And uh, you can output the results of that annotation in a variety of formats, including JSON, uh, raw text, Google protocol buffer, XML, etc. And uh, one of the things that the main thing we're going to talk about uh, today is the server that it also comes with. Um, it's under active development. We have uh, two software engineers kind of working on it a pretty good amount of time. Uh, if you have any questions or issues about it, uh, you can definitely uh, reach out to us on Stack Overflow or GitHub. And um, At any rate, lost my train there. And uh, if you are a company and you'd like to license the software and um, you know use it for a commercial application, I would like to point you out to Chris Tag again. He's in the back, and uh, he's he works at uh, Stanford OTL, uh, handling all of our licensing issues. So, um, just to uh, expand a little bit more on the Stanford Core NLP pipeline, what typically happens is you have your raw text. And then you run it through this uh, pipeline where you uh, tokenize it, uh, you sentence split it, you attach the part of speech tags, you attach the lemmas, you patch, uh, attach the named entity tags, you do dependency parsing and uh, constituency parsing, and then you uh, run coref. And then on top of that, you could do a bunch of other stuff as well. You could uh, clean, if it's an XML document or HTML, you could you know clean out the tags, uh, you know, you get the, con you, you have a variety of constituency parsing options, a variety of co-reference options, trading off accuracy and speed, and uh, there's entity linking. There's kind of like a lot of uh, just sort of miscellaneous functions like true casing, sentiment, uh, text classification, and things like quote attribution. So uh, if you have a document and you want to see that, uh, you know, a quote was said by Joe, you can like get get that kind of information out as well. So that, you know, I really just wanted to highlight that there's like a wide breadth of functionality because this has been developed over, uh, you know, uh, 15 years. So a lot of things have kind of accreted into the software module. Um, 
So one of the things that, uh, that it comes with is a server. And uh, the motivation for the server was developed by uh, Gabor Angeli, which is one of the individuals that uh, Chris mentioned in his talk. And the motivation for it was if you just kind of default use Stanford Corn LP and you're just running on like 20 sentences or something just to kind of see some results. Uh, one of the issues is if you just run a pipeline from the command line and hit enter and uh, get back your annotation, you have to wait a minute because uh, the models that we use can take on the order of a minute or more to load into memory because they're getting into the gigabytes. So especially if you're running co-reference or parsing, it can take, you can sit there for a minute just waiting like, okay, boilerplate, seeing all these things load. So Gabor got sick of doing that and he, he set up the server so that you can load the models and, and the resources once, and then you can just, uh, you know, all day, all night, whenever you want, send NLP requests and get back your full annotation object. So um, basically all you have to do is send a post request. You'll get back, once again, as I was saying, there's a variety of uh, output formats that you can get back. Uh, and there's uh, four endpoints that uh, the server is responsive to. So in addition to being able to send text off and get a full, uh, NLP annotation object, you can also um, send text with uh, search pattern requests. And we have three uh, different uh, search possibilities in Stanford for NLP. If you use tokens regex, you can define patterns in a sentence over tokens and say, you know, I want to see that a person, you know, did a verb to a thing or something like that. And Tregex, you can uh, define patterns over constituency parse trees. So I want to see a tree that has a noun phrase and then it has a verb phrase as a sister or something like that. And Semgrex allows you to develop uh, uh, patterns over dependency parses. So if you want to look for certain kinds of uh, patterns within dependency parses, you can once again send out those kind of requests. And the server will uh, handle all of that and give you back any uh, matches within your uh, sentences. Um, and as I was saying, basically the big advantage of it is it will just immediately cache the annotator and the pipeline into memory and you just have a constant 24 hour service running as long as you have the server going. Um, and uh, you can customize things like what port, you know, timeout, SSL stuff, you can put a username and a password on it uh, and you can have a specified shutdown key when you want to shut it down. Uh, we have like a long term uh, demo that's been running for several years at uh, http core nlp dot run and that's just kind of if you want to go on there and type in a sentence you can get out the the brat brat ah. brat the brat brat is this kind of standard nlp display uh format so you can see uh brat representations of uh of uh the, all the annotations if you visit core nlp dot run but please like just do it as a human because we actually have a problem i think where people uh, hit our server like programmatically because they don't want to figure out how to get it. <laughs> they don't want to figure out how to just download it and start their own. So they like they just write like because it goes down from time to time. And that's my pet theory. I don't know if that's right or not, but I think people just programmatically are calling it and, until it crashes. And they're like, what? And then they complain. And they're like, why did it crash? Anyway. So um, to talk about you know to provide kind of like the picture. So so moving on, um, you know. What we're here today to talk about is Stanford NLP no space, like the Python package. So uh, one of the things that is a major feature of the Python package is that you can actually set up a client that will communicate with the Java server and um, give you back NLP annotations. So it allows you to um, uh, see, it allows you to basically get the Java NLP functionality in Python without doing anything. No Java at all, just all you have to do is hit like one command and you're getting all the Java code kind of seamlessly integrated into your Python application. So how that would work is you might, uh, you might have a server running already. You could, you could start the server just on your own. You could have a dedicated machine as an example that just runs the server and uh, that could be running on a different machine or your machine and, or you could start up the server with the Python application. And then within your Python application, you have a client that can communicate with that server. And say you want to uh, annotate Stanford NLP is great, that sentence, and you have a certain set of annotations you want to get, you can send off a request to that server. Then NLP happens. NLP happens over in the, that, that circle. 
And then when it's done, an annotation gets sent back to the client. And that annotation, as I was saying uh, before, could be any variety of uh, output formats you want. There's, I mean, the, probably the, the ones we focus on are the Google protocol buffer serialized uh, data object or JSON. JSON would be a pretty, like, and just a very obvious JSON representation of the tokens, the sentences, and the variety of NLP app, uh, annotations. And then when you're done with your Python application, you can send a shutdown command to the server and the server will, will close down neatly and do all the cleanup it needs to do and, and be over. Um, so to walk through that in code, um, uh, this first line, I, I'm just right now I'm just gonna give a little brief, uh, very small demo of code. Uh, this first line is just saying import the core NLP client library and uh, you know, that's just an import statement. Then say I wanna uh, annotate the, the text, Joe went to the store, he bought a gallon of milk. Uh, that's my text. This, this next line is the key like ingredient if you're putting this into your Python application. You wanna do with core NLP client, uh, annotators equals the list of annotators you want to use and in this example I'm specifying the RAM that I want the Java server to have as client and uh, what's key about that is I'm, I'm starting the client in a context manager so that's how the when the Python application closes it'll do all the proper uh, shutdown things so you want to when you're launching these clients you want to make sure that you do it in a context manager rather than um, just have client equal something and then manually call, you know, shut down when your application closes. Um, but the, and then within the context of the, within the context manager, uh, all you have to do to get the, all the Java uh, annotations you want is this one line of code, and equals client dot annotate text. And then what happens uh, when this runs, what happens is the message gets sent off to the server, NLP happens in the server, comes back, and then uh, when, when that, when that response happens, the, the, it'll move on. And then uh, the rest of this little demo snippet of code I have is just examples of how uh, the default uh, object that comes back from the Java server is the serialized Google uh, protocol buffer object. So this, these last few lines are just about um, how you would access the NLP once you've actually done it. So all you have to do is say, uh, I'm, I'm gonna make a variable called sentence and I'm just gonna uh, say, I want the first sentence in the document. So and is the overall document. When I do and dot sentence zero, I'm saying give me the first document, first sentence. And then when I have token equals sentence dot token zero, that's just saying give me the first token of the first sentence. Then if I say ner equals token dot ner, um, that's saying give me the named entity tag for that token. And then if I say constituency parse equals the sentence.parse tree, that's giving me the uh, pen tree bank representation of uh, the, uh, no, no, it's not, sorry, I'm wrong. It gives you a serialized tree representation of the constituency parse. And likewise, you can get the dependencies with dependency parse equals sentence.basic dependencies. And you can get the coref chain with uh, and.coref chain. But no NLP processing happened in Python world at all. All of these, all of this happened away from your Python application in the server. And, and then the key is when it's done and your application finishes, this context manager is gonna do all the proper things to shut down the server, hopefully. Um, so there's uh, you know, more expansive documentation about how to use the uh, server and, um, uh, and kind of a sample demo code at the official documentation for Stanford NLP. And there's also a Google Colab notebook, uh, which you can go to, and uh, that has other, uh, another demonstration of using it. And uh, if you wanna get to that Google Colab notebook, you just need to go to the, the uh, main place for Colab and you know, open a new notebook. Oh, sorry. Uh, can this work without having a server being talked to? Like if I have a company which is very uh, about security, can it be available as a library? Well, it has to run internally to your company. But the server can be running on the same box. Like you can just have a local. Yeah, it can run locally. So if you have like a company that has a like a privacy kind of concern, what you would do is run the server on your local machine, you know, internally. 
and then it'll work. So you don't, you absolutely don't, it doesn't have to be something off in the, the web or anything like that. Um, so uh, yeah, if you want to uh, play around with this Colab notebook, uh, you just open a, note, a new notebook, choose uh, the GitHub option, because the, uh, there's a GitHub Colab integration, and uh, search for Stanford NLP. And uh, let's see. So, um, moving along, I thought, uh, so to kind of summarize the whole situation, if you want to uh, work with this situation right now, you should just download uh, the Stanford Core NLP uh, standard distribu distribution jars if you were using Stanford NLP. You just uh, need to set, a, set the Core NLP <laughs> home environment variable so that the, that, uh, the Stanford NLP library knows where to find the Java code. And then um, you just can open up a client, send a request and get back your NLP annotations. And uh, when you're done, uh, everything will be shut down. Um, so uh, the main takeaway I just wanna promote with that is that basically if you want to, if you basically have an NLP application in Python but you wanna use this Java library, this is a very straightforward way to get access to that functionality. So um, I guess with that being said, I'm gonna pass the mic off to, uh, running a little behind me. I'm gonna pass the mic off to uh, Pung now to talk about the next part. Thanks guys. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Pong, and uh, I'm going to talk about our new Python side of things in the same Stanford NLP lab library. Um, and this is uh, about our entirely neural or deep learning package that does um, natural language processing for many languages. Um, this is roughly the outline, but uh, I don't want to read it, so let's uh, dive into it. So the first question I might ask is why would I want a fully neural pipeline to process natural language? Um, the original idea uh, for developing this software uh, actually came from our uh, participation in one of the uh, Connell shared tasks, which is basically a, a competition that uh, academics run uh, every year as a bake-off. And this year, our job was to uh, parse natural language. And it's not just seven or eight natural languages, it's 50 natural languages uh, from raw text to their syntactic representation or dependency parse, uh, which is the universal dependency parse that Chris talked about. So this basically gives you a uh, syntactic understanding of the sentence uh, shown here. Um, and our job is to start from raw text, a string of characters. So apparently this is uh, more, than, uh, more than half of these languages, probably none of us uh, at the NLP group speak. Um, because a lot of them are um, very sort of low resource languages that you probably haven't even heard of. Um, so one of the challenges we run in directly into is that uh, we don't speak them, therefore we don't know how to featureize them. Um, so if you have developed machine learning systems or uh, any kind of NLP systems um, without deep learning, um, you probably know that uh, for something to work, you need to be able to featureize it and uh, eventually train your models, um, train your uh, machine learning models on top of the features. So how can we featureize things without even speaking the language, without even knowing how to process it? That's when uh, deep learning models really shine. Uh, they're essentially uh, data-driven statistical models that you can just uh, train on a large amount of annotated data. And uh, we'll, if we design the model well enough, uh, so that it could represent any language in the set that we're dealing with. Uh, we can actually get away without um, having to uh, engineer any features by hand or any rules by hand. And you can contrast that to um, what happens in our Java code base, um, where, where to tokenize English, uh, we actually have a Java file that's 14, uh, 1400 lines long. Um, and there's a lot of expertise over the years going into oh, this. All written by Hiskin. 
<laughs> a lot of this is written by Chris, actually. Another reason for uh, why a fully neural pipeline is helpful um, is when you don't consider different languages, but consider different flavors of the same language. Um, so we all um, read news, um, maybe from time to time now, um, not every day. Uh, you know that news language is very structured, it's well written. Uh, but we also want to sometimes deal with a social media language that is less structured, there's a lot more emojis going on. Um, so a data-driven system is going to be a lot more helpful in these scenarios because if you don't like what you're seeing, you can collect more data and retrain it yourself. And uh, this is a teaser, but uh, we also uh, adapted this, um, uh, this system, this entire neural system for the, for the better of biomedical uh, natural language processing. So uh, Yuhao later is going to tell you about how we can apply this package um, how, uh, directly into biomedical applications. All right, so I've talked about why we built a neural pipeline, but I haven't really specified what the pipeline is yet. So I'll talk to you next about what I mean by that. So uh, to remind you, we're, uh, we're trying to parse raw text into this uh, syntactic structure of uh, synthesis. So uh, we're re we really have to start with tokenization. And we're doing tokenization also in the data-driven manner. Uh, next step is uh, probably not very familiar to many of you, uh, which is uh, expanding multiple tokens. I'll uh, explain what that is uh, when I come to it. Part of speech and morphological features, this is pretty standard things uh, if you are using uh, NLP in your uh, work. And laminization is basically trying to recover uh, the base form of a word. So for example, in the sentence he says, uh, the lemma for says would be say. And eventually dependency parsing. So this is the, our entire neural pipeline. And I'll try to explain each of these modules and how they actually um, generate the predictions that we can use in Python. And uh, by the way, all of our um, all of our neural pipelines are built in PyTorch, um, so it's uh, very extensible. So I'll start with tokenization. So for tokenization, uh, our, we're faced with the task of converting a stream of characters into something sensible so that our NLP pipeline can actually work with. And we cast this problem as a, a problem of sequence tagging or sequence classification where the input is a sequence of characters. And for each of these characters, we assign it um, a, true or a true or false on three different classes. We ask, is this character an end of a sentence? We ask, is this a character an end of a, a token? And for the third, is this a, a, the end of a multi-word token? So in this German example, uh, this word M is actually uh, two syntactic words, if you speak German. Um, and we'll have to properly deal with it for our uh, downstream um, models to work properly. We need to recover sort of the, the syntactic uh, structure of the sentence. So I'll just walk through this uh, example a little bit uh, so that we're on the same page. So for example, Given the sentence, um, all of the places with X's are uh, where our model is supposed to predict a true, a correct. And all of the blank, pla uh, blank places is where our model is supposed to predict false. So if you read off um, this prediction, this is basically saying that ICH, that's a token. BIN, that's a token. IM is a token, and it's a multi-word token that we need to expand later. I'll explain what expansion is with the same word. Uh, auto is a token. And finally, the period is a token. And we end the sentence there. That's a great question. So uh, sometimes multiple tokens are ambiguous. Um, so our actual um, architecture actually accounts for that. Um, and uh, we sort of designed a context awareness, which I'll partially show next. 
you said that you, you run the model at the character level, but I see one prediction per word. So just because you, you do the prediction only for the last character uh, before a space occurring in the sudden? No, so for all the characters where you see a lot of blanks, we're predicting false. We're predicting this is not an end of token, not mo end of multi word token, not end of sentence. Okay, so talk is so end it's a of binary token. tagging. Okay. Yeah. Is that standard procedure to tag? Well, I mean, Im in German is kind of in a gray area, right? I mean, in colloquial speech, it's a word. But we know right. it's a contraction for anything, right. right? But I mean, is that standard procedure, like to do that with don't and him and things like that? So, so this is the standard that um, the data sets we're working with uh, sort of decided that this is also the standard for universal dependencies, okay. um, because we want to really uh, dive into in the word uh, to figure out its components and assign proper syntactic structures to the so, so in the output parse, it would be broken out. You dive. Any more questions? Great. Um, so what does the model actually look like? Um, this is too small to show, but OK. Um, I have a sentence. I have a stream of characters, I space code. Six letters, very simple. Um, and the first step that we uh, in our process is we're going to represent each of these characters uh, with an, a character embedding or a real vector. Um, so if you have heard about glove embeddings that Chris talked about, word to vec this is very similar to that. Uh, the idea is you want to represent your characters or input in some way so that later when you train the entire system, uh, these can sort of automatically be learned as features. All right, so we, uh, after we build the entire system, we're going to um, give it a loss function, we're going to train it to do uh, the tagging scheme that we just talked about, and all of the errors will be back propagated, or sort of propagated backwards to these uh, vectors, or we're going to update them to perform like features. So after um, featureizing or embedding every uh, single character, we're going to run a bi-directional long short-term memory network on top of it. So just think of it as a uh, state machine, if you want to simplify it. Uh, it's going from left to right and right to left, so that for each character, um, after this operation, we actually condition on the entire character sequence, or a very large portion of it. So we're actually aware of uh, what are the boundaries of other words, uh, or what looks like word boundaries in nearby sentences, all right? And after that, we basically just uh, use the representation of this bidirectional LSTM um, and projected it on, down to three dimensions to make the three predictions we talked about. Is it an end of sentence? Is it an end of word, uh, end of token? Is it an end of a multi-word token? You are using a current network? You are yes. Using do you think uh, there is an interest to test a bidirectional transformer to do these kind of things? That's a great question. So uh, at the time we were developing this, uh, one of the things we thought about was um, we wanted to be super efficient, computationally efficient. Um, so that's why we sort of didn't initially start with transformers, but that's definitely a good idea to test out. So Sorry? So it's sort of hand-built uh, by a lot of academics uh, through many, many, many years. Uh, this is called the Universal Dependencies Project. Um, and we have um, these annotated data sets available in uh, more than 50 languages now. How long for text can it handle? Arbitrarily. Arbitrarily. Yeah, we actually... Um, I didn't mention this detail, but in the actual computation of uh, the Stanford NLP models, uh, we actually segment your uh, text a little bit um, to say 600, token, uh, 600 characters. That's probably more than enough for any sentence, and we'll slide this window forward. Uh, not that I'm aware of in the current release, 
but uh, if you're interested in contributing, <laughs> yeah. But but the point is, um, if you have the synthetic languages, you can actually apply the same neural pipeline very easily. Any uh, questions about the tokenizer? Uh, was there any reason to choose an encoding scheme that marked the final character other than the first? Um, that's a good question. So. Uh, I guess the, the short answer is there really, really isn't not, uh, but we find that uh, the final characters are sort of more uh, unified. So if you look at the end of sentence, end of uh, character, uh, end of words, tokens, end of multi-word tokens, those usually uh, end up on the same place. Um, whereas if you mark the stars, they could be anywhere and there could be leading spaces. Um, that's difficult to deal with. One more question. What if I use the uh, OCR to get some of the uh, uh, photocopied uh, image right, and then translate into uh, sentences, which could have some missing or missing full stops? How does the digital system handle that kind of thing? Uh, you can try it out and, and see. Um, so I guess the more serious answer is uh, if you try out the standard model and it doesn't work well, you can always train your own model to do that. The code and the training code is all, uh, is all available online. What, so maybe I missed this, but what's the benefit of building a neural tokenizer over like a simple regular expression tokenizer? Uh, because, uh, well, at the time, one of the motivations is that we don't speak all of these languages. And some of the languages actually are not space separated, um, like Chinese, like Japanese. Um, we can't you know, possibly have, um, so, so our motivation was to, we want to build one system that works reasonably well for these 50 languages. So another answer is if you've got well-edited English text, yeah, a rule-based tokenizer is just fine, but if you want to start tokenizing social media text, it can be really, really useful to have a machine learn tokenizer. Yeah. I'm just wondering like if you, if there should be like a simple one in between these two, like to get you kind of in that head start or something. Because like presumably hand labeling all of this is, would be tough, but you can kind of get on your example I space code immediately with uh, a regular expression. But it seems like this is really just needed for the special cases when there's like a space regular expression that would change. Yeah, so I guess another answer uh, for that question, uh, if you hold the question for a while, is in the house part of the presentation where you can see that we can train uh, this neural model to be sort of conformative to the biomedical text uh, very, uh, very easily without any feature engineering. We don't have to change any features or any rules. Um, so next I'll talk about the multi-word uh, token expansion uh, component. Uh, so uh, re to remind you a little bit, uh, this is the M word in German, uh, among other words in other languages. Um, so here we basically take a sequence, a sequence approach where um, we follow sort of the same uh, procedure of uh, embedding each of the characters and uh, running them through a bidirectional LSTM for the input and we gather one hidden representation for uh, this entire word, for this entire token, and enroll it with a unidirectional LSTM model to generate the expansion. So think of it as I'm get, getting a summary of the word, of the token, and then enrolling um, with the neural network its uh, corresponding expansion. And on top of that, uh, we have another layer sort of to uh, safeguard, uh, safeguard our uh, neural model. Um, so for this component, we also have a dictionary that looks up, that helps to look up um, common expansions in uh, languages where the number of expansions is limited. So I guess that's one uh, other answer to um, how you can complement this neural model with some symbolic approaches. Is this kind of difficult to work? Do you have a greedy search approach or do you have a Bing search approach? We use Bing search. Okay. Yeah. Sorry to be the German guy again, but um, 
there's there's proper nouns in German, like restaurant names and so on, that would say in, in the name. Mm -hmm. And if you expand it, you destroy the name. That's a fair point. So, I mean, is there any way, I mean, because you kind of want to do NER, you know, prior or jointly with this to, to suppress that. Yeah. So, I mean, Stanford NLP has a notion of word and it has a notion of token. So you still have the, the pre-split Right. Which way is it? So token is before you split, and then you're guessing words from the tokens. And typically, a word is just a one-to-one -one mapping. But in the, in this case, you're splitting it. But actually, that's something I've been working on, and, and in German, yeah. among other things, is we, we when we do our NER, we're making sure at the end of the day you can get back to cool. having the problem. Yeah. So there's always going to be this one-to-many mapping from this token to what we call words. And if you do any or even on the word level, you can always map it back to the tokens. All right, moving on. I'm going to jump ahead to the lemmatizer a little bit because uh, this component is very similar. Uh, to remind you, lemmatization is basically trying to find the original form of a word, uh, the base form of a word. Um, and here we use the same two-tier approach. We first try and look up um, the combination of the part of speech of this word and the word itself in the dictionary. If we can find a lemma, then good, we can actually use that lemma. Otherwise, we use a sequence to sequence approach to roll out this lemma from this word. And this is super helpful, especially uh, if you're dealing with more inflected languages because um, English uh, is actually not uh, so inflected if you look at the spectrum of languages. And I'll jump, jump ahead again and start talking about the dependency parser uh, before I move back to the part of speech part uh, because I'm going to introduce something that uh, is sort of essential uh, to these two components. So just to remind you, dependency parsing is uh, given a sentence of words, we want to assign this tree structure that represents a syntax and uh, sort of the semantic relations between uh, these words in the sentence. So in this tree, <coughs> each node is a word, and each node has a single parent in the tree, except for the root. So in this sentence, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. Uh, the root is the jumped word. That's the main verb action. All right. So how do we actually uh, parse it? Uh, this dependency parser, the underlying idea is largely due to my colleague Ken Dozat, who has already uh, graduated from Stanford. Um, it's called the Neural Deep Bi-Affine Parser. And the main idea is what I'm going to explain next. So given this sentence, I go to Stanford, period. We're going to insert a, an artificial root symbol at the front to represent the root of the tree, uh, because everything in the tree needs to find a parent, needs to find what it depends on, right? And we're going to vectorize each, each of these words, uh, have some representation for each of these words, and pass them through a bidirectional LSTM model. Same business. Um, here's where it differs. For each word, after the bi uh, bidirectional LSTM model, we're going to split it into two separate representations. One of them we call the head representation for when the word is uh, playing the role of a head of the, uh, the word that another word depends on, and another dependent representation for when the word is the dependent in this case. We're on the same page? All right, and how do we actually build this tree? So <clears throat> given these two representations for each word, we're going to compare uh, essentially the dependent representation um, of each word to the head representation of every other word in the sentence. Because there's only one uh, head in the sentence for this word, it's like a classification problem, right? So we're trying to classify uh, for each word, which other word do I find as the parent? And the way we do that is we combine these two vector representations with the bi-affine transform which basically is, if you have these two vectors, uh, we're going to uh, have a matrix in the middle where you can do a, a matrix vector multiplication on both sides and recover a single scalar. 
If you do this for each pair of dependents and heads, you would recover a matrix of uh, probabilities of um, heads uh, for each word in the sentence. And with that matrix, we can decode with uh, minimum spanning tree algorithms to find a final dependency parse. So thank Tim does that for that. Any questions before I move on? We don't, unfortunately. We're not there yet. <clears throat> so uh, last but, but not least, uh, I'm going to talk about the part of speech uh, component. Uh, this is going to be quick and simple. Um, so in this particular task, uh, we're asked to predict not just one kind of part of speech. We have universal part of speech that Chris talked about is uh, sort of designed to generalize between different languages. We have a tree bank specific part of speech, which is um, you know, your part of speech for the pen tree bank or for whatever tree bank that you're working with. And we have morphological features. And uh, to give you an example, I have a sentence, she likes cats. And the universal part of speech is basically saying, this is a pronoun, verb, noun, punctuation. Uh, your pen tree bank uh, representation is going to look like this, which is a little, a, a little bit more fine grained and more tuned towards the English language. And for morphological features, we have a lot more things that we're predicting. So for example, the first word she uh, is a nominal pronoun, its gender is female, its third person pronoun, um, and so on and so forth. So these are all of the things we're trying to predict in this one module. As you can already see, um, all of the, um, there's a strong relation between all of these things. If you know something is pronoun, you, uh, you probably need to predict its person. Is it first person, second person, third person, uh, and so on and so forth. So the way we structure our model is to try and capture the dependency between these uh, different uh, components or these different fields we're trying to fill. So our neural, neural component starts with a word. Again, we pass it through a bi bidirectional LSTM model to get representations. We first use the, the representation to predict the universal part of speech. And then uh, we convert them into embeddings. For, for these universal part of speech tags, we convert them into embeddings. And we feed the embeddings and the bidirectional LSTM output uh, into one of the bi-affine components that I just mentioned to predict uh, the tree bank specific part of speech and the morphological features. This way, we make sure that all of the predictions for uh, XPOS, the tree bank specific part of speech, and the morphological features are conditioned on our prediction of the universal part of speech. This way, we make sure that it's more uh, sort of uniform, uh, the predictions are more consistent, and we actually show that this is a, a lot more uh, accurate than some counterparts that we experimented with. With that, I'll hand this over to Yu Hao, and he'll talk to you about how customizable this neural pipeline is. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Yu Hao. Uh, I'm also a student of uh, Chris. So next, I'm going to talk about, like, just in general, how this entire system performs. And then early on, I think there's some questions about, like, why we want to build, like, fully neural systems. Um, even for like tokenization and lemmatization and all other kind of stuff. So I, what I'm going to show next is that this actually offers us um, the flexibility and the extensibility to actually uh, extend our system to different languages, actually more than 50, uh, 50 languages, and at the same time different domains very, very quickly and to achieve state-of-the-art uh, state performance. And hopefully after this session you'll be more convinced that uh, the neural system actually has these kind of advantages. Uh, so, so first of all, I'm going to start with the multilingual part of the results. Um, so as part of this package, uh, so first of all, as part of this package, we already pre-trained uh, different neural systems uh, for, uh, for 53 different uh, human languages. Uh, and then you can just readily, uh, you can just download these models online and use them um, uh, immediately uh, if you have the, the library installed. 
Um, yeah, so, but in terms of multilingual performance, so we evaluate our system on a specific uh, a set of data sets uh, as part of the 2018 universal dependency share task. Uh, so it basically, um, so it, it's a task that's particip by, uh, participated by different uh, industrial companies and uh, academic groups. And then, um, so what it does is that it provides you with a, a, a set of different training data sets for a set of different languages and then also provide you with the test set or the evaluation set. And then finally, uh, you submit your system and then all the system will be scored um, uh, in, uh, on all these different languages and aggregated uh, on all these languages and produce this final score. So, and then all these scores, uh, basically uh, they are evaluated, uh, so our system were evaluated uh, from the tokenization to parsing. So it's end to end evaluation of almost every component in the system. So here's the results of our system in comparison to the top numbers of all other systems. Uh, so one thing to note is that this line here is actually not a single system, but really the, the highest number of that metric. You can see that our system either achieves the best performance on that metric or very close to the best performance without even any, like, without any feature engineering, literally. And then uh, if you look at our other system, some of them actually contains a lot of feature engineering for different languages. And, um, so here's the more fine grained results on different languages. Uh, we have English, French, German, Hindi, but for sure all other different kind of languages. And you can see right away that the numbers are generally very high. And for Hindi, it's for some reason, it actually performs really, really well uh, for that language. Um, okay, so here are some more examples uh, of different languages. So we have traditional Chinese on top and some syntactic analysis results, and then Arabic, Hindi, and Dutch uh, to just give you a sense of how this uh, model works. Um, uh, you can literally just download the model and try it uh, yourself if you want. Okay, so the next part is that I'm going to show you how we can adapt our system really quickly to a different domain. Uh, in, in this case, uh, the biomedical domain, uh, because there's actually a lot of need from the biomedical commu uh, community uh, to apply natural language processing technique to uh, understand either clinical notes or biomedical uh, uh, literature uh, text. Uh, just to you know, help improve healthcare in general. So that's why we built this system, uh, which is uh, actually still under development, but it, it will be released later this year, most likely. Uh, so it's actually two different, se two separate NLP pipelines. So the first one is a pipeline that's dedicated for biomedical literature analysis. So whatever you find in a paper, a biomedical paper, uh, we can do syntactic analysis on top of that. Uh, and then also uh, the second pipeline for clinical reports. So if you know this domain, you, you understand that biomedical and clinical, the texts are very, very different. Um, so they follow very different distributions. Uh, so yeah, so really uh, the goal of this system is to optimize for state-of-the-art performance, but, but also at the same time, um, the ease of installation and use. Uh, so it, it, so if, uh, if you want to use the system, it will be just as, uh, as easy as using our system for a different language. So just download the model and plug it in and use it. Okay, so these are some preliminary results just to demonstrate you how well the system adapts to different domains. Uh, so this is um, uh, one of the data set of a biomedical literature analysis called Genia dataset. It's a collection of biomedical art uh, abstracts uh, and then hand annotated with different kind of, uh, you know, different kind of uh, syntactic annotations. So. And then here are uh, results from some existing systems. I'm not sure if you can see all of these numbers, but then, so the first one, the first two rows are two Java system, Core NLP and NLP4J. And the numbers, I took them from uh, a, a paper uh, that's uh, you know, released earlier this year. Uh, but roughly, uh, you, know, you can see that the number's not, it's okay, but not very high. And then also, uh, so earlier this year, I think Allen NLP, they released this, uh, toolkit called SciSpacey, which is actually created for analyzing biomedical uh, text. And then also, th uh, this is their results uh, end to end. And then finally, it's our pipeline results. You can see that we're basically the best on all of these metrics from tokenization to parsing. Yes. Is the row our pipeline? Is that your custom biomedical? Our customs, or yes. We, we your, trade them. Uh, normal standard NLP? Like so the, the English? Uh, I think it's somewhere be, like uh, it's definitely lower than this number. Uh, I think it's somewhere around 80 on the parsing, roughly. Yeah. So after after training the model on the Genia data set, it gets to somewhere around 90 in terms of parsing. Yeah. 
So the second, uh, there's another data set called Craft, which is uh, the difference between Genia and Craft is that Genia is, it only has abstracts. So the text is still like relatively clean and, ni and nicely you know, structured. So the Craft data set is actually full biomedical articles. It contains all different kinds of you know, uh, formulas and like, the gene names and all that kind of stuff. And, and then you can see that, uh, so we basically retrain the site spacing model on, on this data set. And then we also train our pipeline and for some reason, the size spacing model uh, doesn't do very well on this data set. So for the part of speech model, it, it gets to about like somewhere between 80 and 90 accuracy, but our model can get to 98 accuracy on part of speech tagging. But, and for, for parsing, we can get to like 91, 92, but then the, their model only, is only, get, get, uh, only able to get to like 70, 78, 77, yeah, ish. So you can see how powerful our, 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 our model is. And then this is just to demonstrate like a single example, a simple example. I literally just searched this sentence in PubMed today. So this is a, a paper that came up just today. So you can see in this sentence, there's some kind of gene named, and then there's some uh, chromosome name, which is weirdly structured. Uh, if, you, if you have a, like a general purpose NLP tool, it might just fail on analyzing this text, but then you can see that our model did pretty well on analyzing this. Uh, yeah. The, this entire tool pipeline is still under construction, but it's gonna uh, be released soon. Okay, so hopefully you're slightly more convinced at least that uh, the full neural system, it has some merits. Yeah. So, sorry, maybe I, I, I missed something. Uh, I didn't see any name entities extraction in your pipeline. I'm gonna talk about that oh, very soon, yeah. Um, For, for this example? Uh, so, so all these numbers, we train them specifically on biomedical corpus. So they are trained on biomedical corpus. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Uh, so, to the one. oh, uh, for the clinical one, we, we it's still under construction. We're working on that. We don't have the results yet. But this is this is only for the biomedical pipeline. Yes. Yeah. That, that's a great question. So for, for these numbers here, we, we didn't include the statistical results, but if we are writing a paper or something, we will include statistical uh, comparison. Well, I mean, just so you can like, you know, like, uh, narrow down your actual Yeah. Sure. Um, we don't, uh, we didn't do that here. Yeah. Okay. So, but I think that's a great suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the data sets that you trained this on, were they uh, fully annotated from tokenizing to parsing? Sorry, uh, the infinity parse, all of it. So they come in the tree band format, which means that they actually, so it's slightly more complicated. Uh, so for example, for the crap, uh, or for both of them, they only come with constituent annotation. And then we actually, at Stanford, we developed this core NLP uh, universal dependency converter, which, which can actually convert constituent annotation to dependency annotation. So the dependency annotation was converted, but it's based on the constituent annotation. So the data set comes with um, the token annotation, uh, part of speech annotation, and constituent annotation. And we, con we convert it to dependency annotation and train the system. Uh, we're slightly over time, I think, so I, I will move on, and then we can talk about it later if you are, have a lot of questions. And then, yeah, so uh, just quickly wrap this up. So just a few other highlights about this system. Uh, so one thing that's uh, worth no, uh, worth mentioning is that this system, we, it's very friendly to uh, switch between devices. So by default, if you have a CUDA device, uh, and then you have the CUDA uh, uh, visible to the, to the pipeline that you're building, it will automatically use the CUDA GPU. Uh, but then you can also uh, specify or force the pipeline to use CPU, even though a GPU is available. So it's, it can run on both devices. 
And then also we provide scripts that are, allows you to train your own models, um, whatever corpus that you have. As long as it conforms to a, sing, a specific format, you can train your own system on it. Um, I think right now the training pipeline, uh, the training system is a little bit clunky, but we're gonna improve that uh, over, the, uh, over time. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about next steps. So the future plans of this. So the first thing that we're gonna do is to rename it. <laughs> <laughs> so the, so name, the name was my idea, the original name was my idea. So. Yeah, so I think uh, we talk about like the confusion between Stanford Core NLP and Stanford NLP and Stanford Space NLP. Yes, uh, so, uh, so I think we just realized over the last few months that you know, calling it Stanford No Space NLP is probably not the best naming strategy. Uh, so this happens when we search for Stanford NLP on yeah. Twitter, and then you know everything that we find was about the group, not about the system, or on GitHub, for example. And then also, like if you ask somebody, like you know, have you heard about this new like Python toolkit that we do called Stanford NLP? And like, wait a minute, I thought that's in Java. I was like, no, that's Core NLP. Uh, so, but anyway, we're renaming it, and then this is going to happen for the next release, and then we're going to call it Stanza. It has a prefix Stan, which kind of like have the Stanford thing in it, but then also it's just on itself a cute name, I think. I think this is Chris's idea. Credits go to Chris. Uh, and also, uh, another thing that we will add is to support more languages. Uh, we're gonna expand it to more than 80 languages by end of this year, uh, just with more annotations from the community. So the credits should go to the community, not us. Uh, so, Name entity recognition, it doesn't, we doesn't have that in the current release of the system, but we were gonna add this. And we're gonna support about, I think, eight major languages uh, for the first release uh, for name entity recognition. Yes? Which kind of uh, name entity class do you expect? What, what is your ontology at the beginning? Uh, for English, we haven't decided yet. So we have already implemented the system, but we haven't decided which types of entities that we're gonna include. Uh, for the default is like the default class is usually uh, for all these major languages are at least have organization, person, and uh, location, and then MISC, which is you know cover all different other kinds of classes. But for English, for example, we we might be able to include much more types, uh, including like number, duration, and all that, because we just have the resource available. But for other languages, it's unclear yet. Uh, for the biomedical pipeline, we are going to also have name entity recognition. Uh, including cancer, uh, sorry, uh, disease names, uh, drug names, protein names, gene names, and all other kind of different entities. Yeah. yeah. Since you worked on increasing the number of languages, how hard is it to add any language, like one language? How hard is it? Oh, uh, I'm going to say that. Um, so really, the power of adapting to different language comes from the neural pipeline, which is already there. It's just a matter of you know training the system and make it work. I think really the difficult part is to have people who understand the language contribute to the data sets. So that's why I think uh, Chris has like advocated for a very long time that you know in the academic uh, world for people to contribute to annotate some of these data. Yeah. Regarding contributions, do you take only do you read only for the universal dependency project? Yeah. Or Uh, it's not. It's not. It's not only applies to UD. It's just the, that it happens to be the case that UD has so many language supports. Uh, really, if you if you use our system, uh, what it only requires you to convert your data into the kernel format. It doesn't have to be UD. Yeah. Yes. What's the timeline? Um, I'm gonna say in the next two months. <laughs> the, hope is, the hope is before the end of the year. If we got sponsor, <laughs> oh, man, it we can dope. sponsor a few more graduate students, this is going to be released way more faster. Trust me. Yes. About, about uh, not, not sponsoring, but input. If, so, for example, some people provide you with documents with annotated uh, entities, mm -hmm. do you think you can extend your, uh, include this kind of class uh, of ontology in, in this project, for example? Because, for example, in my domain, the geoscience, yeah. uh, by default, maybe you didn't include this ontology into your project. But if we go to see you with uh, thousands of documents already annotated with the geoscience ontology, yeah. is it possible for you to imagine that you include this ontology into your 
So this is something that I'm going to talk about very soon. Um, <coughs> wait me for like one minute. Okay. So that concludes the NER part, I think. Uh, so another thing, a few things to mention is improved functionality. So uh, we're going to add character offsets uh, into the system. Uh, it doesn't have it right now, but we're going to add that. And then we're going to have more friendly document object and property interface just to make it easier for everyone to use and train the system. And all these will come in the next release, which is 0.3.0. We actually already have them in the dev branch. It's just a matter of releasing them and training all the systems. Um, and then finally, we're going to include a model zoo. I think that relates to your point, uh, which will allow the community to actually contribute their models, train on maybe their own data sets or some other available data sets or some other languages, uh, and then submit the model. Uh, to us, and then we're going to host it and maybe just make it easy for everyone to download and use them. Does that answer part of your question? Really? Yeah. Okay, so it's, I'm not sure if I should still do the demo. Do we have time to do that? I think so. small up there. Yeah, so, so this is really, uh, it was meant to be a really short one uh, because this is actually already hosted on Colab. Uh, so one thing I can do is to walk you through how to open this. Uh, this, this, nah, this, just note. Just, just skip it. Just skip it. Okay. Just skip it. <laughs> sure. Okay. So the final chapter is about resources. Uh, I'm going to stay on this page for like a few ten, 10 seconds so that you can take a picture if you want. So the first one is the website, the official website, uh, and then all the documentation you can find um, there. And then the GitHub page, if you have questions, uh, the best form is to start a GitHub issue on the GitHub page. And then we have the system paper. Uh, you can uh, read about all the model details there. And then finally, the group web page for all the information, all the project that we did. Yeah, and then before we go into the question, there is the you know, uh, Google form, uh, if you want. So we welcome your feedback, just how, what kind of features you want in the system, or if you want to hear about more about this, leave your email, and we will create a mailing list or something like that. And then finally, we'll go into the questions. But I'll go back to this. Yeah. Thank you. All right, I think we can uh, have questions for five minutes. Uh, you can ask of any of the speakers, um, and then we can break, and, and you can ask any additional uh, questions one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, for all the links, I'll send this out um, uh, on the uh, Meetup uh, RSVP that you've already got. So. Uh, if you don't capture them now, uh, you'll get that in your inbox tomorrow. All right, who was uh, who's a burning question right here? Okay, I got a totally unfair question. It's really broad, but I think you guys might have some time. So, if I, I'm thinking about how to apply this stuff uh, to transform the user experience of conventional application. So, for example, if you imagine uh, transforming an Excel or a PowerPoint or an author into something that's natural language driven. How big of a step is it, and what kind of like insight can you give as far as going from this fancy parsing to that level? Yeah, so that's probably too big a question <laughs> to seriously try and answer in this context. Um, but you know. I mean, I'm not quite sure where we're going with Excel, but you know, there's a vast range of places where there's at least pieces of natural language and a lot of conventional systems just say, oh, that's a blob of text and you can't do anything with it, or there are words there um, and we can index them for sort of standard information retrieval. And so any place where you want to do more than that and understand something of the actions and events and properties that are being described, then you can use more natural language structure. And then, you know, the details depend a lot, but there are a lot of places where just knowing about verbs and their subjects and their objects, or which adjectives are modifying different nouns, can give you useful information to do better things. I mean, sometimes in even very sort of simple ways, knowing parts of speech can help. There are lots of places where people can improve their, you know, advertisement matching or their search or things like that by just making use of part of speech structures. But, you know, I think we can't go through a huge detail of all of them right now. All right, up the back here and then, then in front was next. Yes.
I think uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with your sentiment and I mean the spacey Matthew came out and visited us a year ago or a year and a half ago so I definitely think we want Stanford NLP crossed it out stanza we want stanza to be user friendly with spacey <clears throat> at the bare minimum and I mean I I think Allen NLP is already pretty friendly. It's kind of integrates well with Spacey. So I definitely think we want to talk to Matthew and, and make Stanza very usable in, in, uh, Stan, in so uh, Spacey. Matthew being Matthew Honable when yeah, he found yeah, us up Spacey. The, yeah. The, yeah. I guess we didn't cover that, but I mean, the Stanford NLP, the Python package has an Apache license. Yeah, um, yeah so if, if I just do an addendum on whether things will come together, I mean, you know, I'd very much doubt it. I mean, obviously there are lots of reasons for various kinds of interoperabilities and there are various kinds of interoperabilities like Jason just mentioned, but you know, I think overall there's an environment in which more companies are doing things with NLP, there are more academic research groups than there were 15 years ago, so I kind of think the only reasonable thing to, to predict is that there will be more libraries out there to choose between, <laughs> not that they'll all coalesce together. All right, I think we've got time for two more questions uh, here and then a uh, gentleman in, in red afterwards. I work with clinical text that has a lot of spelling errors, which kind of gets messed up when you tokenize. Uh, can your character level tokenizer like fix spelling errors? Since it's taking in characters, but then the output is a token? Um, I think it's, it's not, I mean, it's not part of the definition of tokenization, really. So the, what the tokenization model or the tokenizer does is really just break it into different tokens. So spelling connect correction is maybe something you're talking about that then. In theory, you could, you could build something like that into our model space, but it's gonna be a different module, but not tokenization. Yeah. It seems like it fits nicely with your multi-word expansion. It could be a you could already, spelling error expansion. You could already use our uh, lemmatizer uh, for that. So you can use the lemmatizer, train the lemmatizer model on this task um, and perform uh, spell correction. So it's kind of like sequence to sequence learning where you take a wrongly spelled token and then to produce a correct token. But uh, it's a matter of creating, having the data, or the right data to enable that kind of model. Yes. Yeah, um, you know, there's a number of uh, products that are rapidly growing right now around uh, conversational agents. Uh, that rely on automatic speech recognition, and you know it's a, it's a well-known hard problem to map. You know what comes out of speech recognition, all sorts of ways that people noise gets into those systems, even if the tokens are perfectly spelled. You know, right? And then to map that onto dependencies. Um, however, actually, these companies end up just hiring legions of language engineers to effectively do that through these different grammar constructions. So I'm curious. Um, what, uh, if you're familiar with work right now on you know, uh, being able to map the kinds of uh, issues that come up with automatic speech recognition, sort of the, the, the ways people, you know, even while I'm talking right now, the, the various repetitions and stuff, and being able to map that onto these nicely formed dependencies, I can imagine that would save you know, an enormous amount of labor right now in technology. Um, yeah, um, yeah, so I guess there are a lot of aspects there, but people, have absolutely worked on that. I mean, you know, there are sort of people have certainly worked on types of speech errors, right? There are sort of fillers with the ums and ers, but then there are sort of um, restarts when you say some number of words and start it again, and how to sort of process those and kind of most of the time what people speak is basically grammatical sentences if you can get rid of all of the ums, ahs, the restarts and re repairs. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, people have done specialized models to handle some of those phenomena and have clean sentences coming out, yeah. And I mean, even in the universal dependency space, um, that um, our colleagues 
um, at UC Davis have been working on specifically um, building an English Universal Dependencies Corpus for um, spoken um, chatbot conversation. Oh, okay. What's the, what's the, uh, who leads that group? Um, Joe Yu. Joe uh, how do you spell it? Z H O U. Z H O U. And then the last name is Y U. Y U. All right. Oh, 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 Joe as in O Z H O U is the Joe, and then Y U. Yeah, okay. it's the first name, and then last name is Y U. Oh, perfect. Okay, great. And you see Davis. Great. Thank you very much. All right. So we've been sitting down for half an hour. So I think we can cut the uh, two hours. I should say. So we can. Um, <laughs> no, it's we, we can. <laughs> people got here early. <laughs> So we can, uh, uh, you can, uh, you're welcome to, to come up and ask more questions. A couple of really quick housekeeping things. Uh, for the next meetup, uh, uh, Samsung Next are going to host. That's Samsung's innovation wing, the exact date and, and location to be determined. Um, they're a, a really interesting innovation group. They invest in NLP companies, one of my favorite investors I've ever had. Um, so especially if you have a startup, uh, uh, keep an eye out for that one. Uh, and please join me in, in thanking our, our hosts, uh, Astound and First Republic, uh, First Bank, who came to us. And uh, thank you again to our presenters from Stanford NLP and Stanza. <laughs>